All right. So what I wanted to do today is just give you and discuss Hobbes' background. Um, before I do, I'm going to pass this around. For those of you who are interested in the topic, I write a, a blog on money and the address is here. I just wrote one on taxes. So if anybody has any curiosity about paying taxes, <laughs> um, that's the, the, there's a whole bunch of topics on it and I'm trying to promote financial education for students because I think too often these days schools don't teach us much financial education and oftentimes your parents don't, they just do it for you. And then they set you loose on the world and you don't know. You know. So, um, so check that out if, you, if you're interested in that. Um, all right, so as I said, this isn't a very flattering portrait of Hobbes. I've seen nicer ones, but uh, <laughs> there he is. Um, the background in Hobbes' case has to do with the English Civil War, okay, which this event probably influenced him more than anything else. Um, there's a lot to it. It's, it's a, actually a fairly complex event, uh, but it began in 1642, and it began for a couple of main reasons. Okay? One, religious differences, and two, economics. Okay? That probably sh that shouldn't come as a surprise, right? Um, religion and money make people fight. <laughs> um, as far as religion goes, King Charles the First. First of all, one religious aspect was he had married a Catholic, a French princess Henrietta, and so already the people uh, of England were kind of suspicious of Charles the First because uh, England was a Protestant country. Uh, its official church was the Church of England, but there you know, was very strong Protestantism and Puritanism in England. And so the fact that he married a French woman who was a Catholic made him suspicious. And uh, they didn't like it. Of course, monarchs married people from other countries in order for diplomatic reasons you know, to bring the two countries together to prevent war. And, and Charles sought a policy of avoiding war with France. Um, his lack of money pretty much brought to a halt the English, the uh, Thirty Years' War. He just couldn't pay for it, didn't want to do, didn't want to be at war. Um, so that was one religious aspect. Another was Charles the first tried to impose upon the Scots the so-called English Book of Common Prayer. He wanted the Scots to worship as Anglicans in the same way that the English did. The Scots at this time were under the control of the English, but they didn't like it and didn't want to be and didn't quite accept it. Okay? And they wanted to worship their way. Um, they did have an official church of Scotland it wasn't that different from the English church, uh, but there was strong currents, a uh, strong amount of Presbyterianism in Scotland. They resented what they had to do to conform to the English ways. And then when Charles decided that they must worship exactly the way um, that the English worshiped, they rebelled. Well, now Charles had a war that he didn't want. Um, and he had to pay for it somehow. He had avoided having a parliament for something like 10 years because he couldn't get along with his parliament. Um, and so he had just ruled without them. But when the Scots rebelled, he needed money and he'd run out of other ways of collecting that money. So he needed to call up parliament for help to get the money out of the people, okay? So there's the religious background. Also at this time, England was moving away from the feudal system to a more modern economy. So the aristocrats, the nobles, who had long lived on these vast estates were beginning to become poor. They, they, couldn't, uh, they couldn't keep people on their land. Sometimes they threw them off in order to try to make money raising sheep or cattle. Um, and more and more of these former peasants were moving to London and other cities and making money in new 
businesses. So the business class was rising, or the so-called bourgeois class was on the rise. This created a whole new group of people who didn't think in the old traditional way. They didn't think in terms of their natural superiors. Um, more and more literacy, more and more of a sense of independence, okay? And they were not happy with being told exactly how to worship either, okay? Many of them were Presbyterians or Puritans of one form or another, um, and they didn't particularly appreciate having to support the English church, the official church. Uh, the English official church was, it was not Catholic, it was very anti-Catholic. However, it had kept the, all the outward, a lot of the outward um, uh, dimensions of Catholicism. So the English priests were priests, they wore their robes, they had the, the Eucharist, you know, the body and blood, and all of that was the same. Uh, and they didn't like that. They didn't particularly appreciate having to spend their tax money to support it, okay? So when Charles called the Parliament up, it represented, of course, a lot of these people. They sent people to the Parliament that might sympathize more with the Scots who were rebelling than they sympathized with the king, okay? This wasn't what he wanted, but it was difficult for him to avoid you know, because of the system. Mm -hmm. So you said he called Parliament after those ten years because of the he needed money. In Scotland. Right, he needed money to put down the rebellion in Scotland. But ironically, um, many of the people who were elected to Parliament sympathized with the Scots, or at least they weren't happy about helping Charles with his goal of making them all into good Anglican church worshipers. <laughs> so once Parliament came into existence, these people started to talk amongst themselves and disagreed more and more with the king. And it wasn't long before they decided to oppose him. They wouldn't support taxes be, to be raised for this project. And furthermore, they actually began to raise money to pay for their own independent army. Well, once that happened, Charles was faced with very few options. Okay? The parliament was armed, okay? it had appointed its own generals, and Charles didn't have very many resources. So he went to his nobles and he basically said, if we don't fight, this is the end of the monarchy, this is the end of our way of life. Right? So they contributed, they raised an army as well. So now you have the um, you know, the army of the royalists is what they were called, the supporters of the monarchy, and the army of the parliament, okay? All right, so, by the way, parliament was summoned in 1640, and by 1642 they were at war, okay? And um, the English war was not a, uh, was not a pretty thing. About three-quarters of a million people died in the English Civil War. Um, and it was, uh, well, let me just tell you some of the weaponry involved. They had cannon uh, that were not explosive cannon. They were the, you know, the cannon that would fire balls that would basically just roll through people and, you know, decimate people. They had uh, muskets the old-fashioned kind that you would pour powder down. You had, to, you had to do about five different motions before you could even get them to fire. So they formed rows and they, you know, coordinate firing. The first row would, would, you know, kneel down after they fired. The second row would fire and so forth. But a lot of times by the time these guys got ready to fire, the other side was firing at them. And, you know, whole rows of men would just be would be cut off that way. They fought with pikes, those sticks that you see there were one of the more effective ways of fighting. If you didn't die right away, you were likely to be able to get up close enough to their cal cavalry and their footmen to be able to either kill with sword or with these pikes, which you could use to fend off and, and founder horses. 
So it was bloody, and of course the, um, uh, the ability of, of doctors of the day was very bad. Um, if you've ever studied the American Civil War, things hadn't changed that much. In the meantime, they had, they had a very primitive machine gun, uh, but basically the same sort of methods. And, uh, you know, people died. Uh, if they didn't die immediately, they'd be in these horrible hospitals, camp hospitals. So Hobbes, of course, he, he didn't stick around for this civil war. I shouldn't say of course, but, you know, if you, the more that you read of Hobbes' philosophy, the more you might guess that he would leave, if possible. And he did. Before he left, he was a tutor to uh, the, the Cavendish family, who were, they were a noble family, uh, and he tutored their children, and he was a secretary for the Earl of Devonshire. Um, but he was also very friendly with the monarch, and he left and fled to France, uh, Charles I was not so lucky, but Charles II, Charles's son, fled to France and was hosted by the French. And Hobbes tutored Charles II, the young son of Charles I there in France. So that's where he spent the majority of the Civil War. So he wasn't there to personally witness this, but he certainly heard all about this carnage. And he felt like this was the worst thing that could possibly have happened to his country, that it was a catastrophe, and that civil war generally was a catastrophe, because in civil war, unlike international war, <clears throat> you lose all protection, you lose all uncertainty, because your own government is not in charge. It's being challenged, and it may not be able to protect you, and the sides shift back and forth, and you don't know where to turn for protection. Okay. So <clears throat> it was a disaster that he fervently did not want repeated. Okay. Now, um, I think maybe in my previous slide, let me go back. I mentioned Oliver Cromwell. Yeah, the protectorate of Oliver Cromwell came after Charles was executed in um, 1649. Uh, first, there were a series of attempts to rule by Parliament directly, but Oliver Cromwell was a prominent general during the Civil War for the Parliament side. And he was a Puritan, which meant that he was a very uh, enthusiastic, sort of what we might call fundamentalist Christian. Um, he believed that uh, very fervently uh, at, for Protestantism and against even Anglican or Church of England type Christianity, let alone Catholicism. Um, he was very charismatic, okay? So he had the loyalty of just about everybody, different types of Protestant Christians. Um, but when he took over, he called it the protectorate. The idea was that he was the protector of England and he would make sure that now that you know the monarchy wouldn't come back and that the will of the people would prevail. But um, Hobbes wrote an entire book about the English Civil War in the aftermath of the protectorate and then the restoration. It was called Behemoth. And his view was that Oliver Cromwell, who ruled between 1653 and 1659, was so dictatorial and so puritanical, and meaning that he made everybody have to live the exact same way according to his moral rules, okay? Um, there were all sorts of laws, laws against, um, you know, how women and men ought to interact, uh, how they should be married, um, with, that they couldn't drink, <laughs> uh, all sorts of rules, and um, he says that over time people lost their enthusiasm as they felt more like they were simply being controlled and they came to resent it. And as, as Machiavelli says, remember Machiavelli said, if you don't stick to the old ways when you take over new territory, 
if you change rules drastically, as soon as people become uncomfortable, they look back to the old way and they say, you know what, that wasn't so bad. Charles I wasn't so bad. Actually, this is worse. <laughs> but it takes a while for people to get there. He, um, he was finally deposed, well actually no, Oliver Cromwell died in 1659 and then when his son Richard tried to take over from him, that's when he was deposed and the English people actually asked Charles II to come back from France and the, and the monarchy was restored in 1648. So this, this said to Hobbes, a lot of times people don't know what they really want. They think they want these big changes until it becomes inconvenient for them. When they realize that many, many people are going to die and that life isn't going to be all that they expected it to be, they become disappointed and they want to go back to that more secure, you know, certain setting, okay? So how do we convince them to not make these decisions in the first place, okay? That became his goal. Uh, Behemoth uh, is, a, is a book, as I said, that covers the history of the English Civil War from, from Hobbes' perspective. It's obviously biased, anti-Civil War, um, anti-Puritan. Um, and so, I mean, you, if you wanted to learn about the Civil War, you'd have to do more than read Behemoth, but you certainly get his point of view. Um, and he was very happy when Charles II was restored. You might ask yourself, how did this young man ever dare to come back to this country? You know what I mean? Uh, they, they were bred to be quite brave. Uh, Charles, the, Charles I, his father, when he died, he was beheaded. And um, he didn't want to show any fear. He walked up and he, he had asked to be to put have a jacket or a second shirt uh, for this because it was cold out and he didn't want people to see him tremble. Um, Charles II, his son, uh, was brave enough to come back and of course the lure of being able to rule a country is a pretty nice uh, temptation. <laughs> um, and, and the English were ready to settle down. You know? So, you know, Hobbes learned from this, as I said, that the people want stability. Fundamentally, they, when they're confronted with chaos, what they want more than anything else is stability. But they forget that sometimes. When things get too good, when they're prosperous, when they, they actually forget what is most important. And that's when they get lured into these religious uh, and ideological confrontations. And, and in Behemoth, he said, they get lured into these fights by elites. Okay. It's not the idea of the common people, he said. It's always the idea of the elites. And they do this for their own benefit. They do it because they want power. They use rhetoric to tell people, oh, you know, this is the one true religion, or this, is, um, this will empower the people. But what they really want is to empower themselves. So this is the lesson that he learned. Okay, so he watched as this whole transformation took place, this uh, demolishment of the sitting monarch and actually the shocking demolishment of the monarchy as an institution for a while. The experiment with a sort of democratic rule that turned into a dictatorship in his view under Oliver Cromwell. And then the rejection of that experiment and a return to the old monarchy with Charles II, okay? So very, very um, interesting times. And he came back, of course, when Charles II came back. So he was in exile, so to speak, for about 10 years, a little bit less than 10 years. So he was in France when he wrote this book that you have, Leviathan. Okay? And there's the uh, original picture that was on the front cover of it or I think it was the inside piece. I don't believe it was originally colored. I think it was black and white. But if you looked very carefully at the figure there of the king, what you would see is lots and lots of little people making up his body. And the message there was that 
you know, the king represents the people, right? And the people make up his body, his ability to, to rule effectively. Hmm. It's a very old-fashioned image in a way, but Hobbes is going to rewrite this uh, in a different way. Okay. Leviathan was a book that was sort of out of, out of its element or out of time. Um, this was a time when, as, as you can see, people were highly religiously motivated one way or the other. And they were also either for or against the traditional monarchy one way or the other. And Hobbes' book tries to take a different path, not taking either side. Okay, so he wasn't liked by the Puritan Christians or the you know the more radical Protestants because he didn't his work did not seem to be religious enough. It didn't seem to be that he believed fervently in God, you know, and he wasn't saying that Christianity is the solution to our problems. He wasn't very very well liked by the Anglicans because. You know, he, he didn't think that 